You're tuned into the COVID-19 Community Report here on KDRT-LP 95.7 FM in Davis, California. I'm Autumn Labbe Renault, and today is Tuesday, February 16th, 2021. We're sharing local news and resources focusing on what's impacting Davis and nearby cities in Yolo County during the COVID-19 pandemic. This month, I'm doing a series devoted to the reopening of in-person instruction in the Davis Joint Unified School District. Last week, I spoke with DJUSD Superintendent John Bowes, and I have two interviews today. Teachers Amy George and Diana Stommel, and Diana is also the current president of the Davis Teachers Association. Next week, I'll speak with parents who are at different points on the spectrum regarding reopening. I've spent the last few weeks talking about the county's interest form for the COVID-19 vaccination, which it launched on January 19th, and that was before the implementation of the state of California's My Turn system. Last Friday, the county announced that as part of a statewide directive, it has transitioned away from its online vaccination interest form to embrace the use of My Turn. The My Turn website allows all Californians to register for an email or text notification to inform them when they're eligible for vaccination. Eventually, the system will also allow residents, if eligible, to book an appointment for a vaccination. The state first launched the My Turn system through trial periods with Los Angeles and San Diego counties, and it's now in the process of expanding the usage to all county and healthcare vaccine providers. My Turn allows vaccine providers to input data immediately, giving a real-time look at the number of shots administered regionally and statewide, while also allowing for a centralized notification system. About 35,000 residents have registered with Yolo County since January 19th. Unfortunately, due to the inability to migrate the county's data into the state system, if you've registered already, you'll be getting a link to register again, and you'll need to do that to stay current. The My Turn website is currently available in English and Spanish with an additional six languages coming in mid-February. But for Californians who don't have internet access or need support in a different language, they can call 1-833-422-4255 and connect with an operator directly in English or Spanish or via a third party operator in 254 additional languages. That's pretty cool. All residents are encouraged to register with My Turn at myturn.ca.gov. And please remember, for all information about Yellow County's other COVID-19 vaccine distribution process and general information, visit yellowcounty.org slash coronavirus dash vaccine. Residents can also call Yolo 211 for resource information. Today's interviews are part of a series examining the many facets to reopening our local schools to in-person instruction and the multiple viewpoints around this issue. This week, I'm speaking with teachers. Amy George teaches sixth grade at Birch Lane Elementary in Davis, where she's taught for 20 years. Thanks for joining us today, Amy. Of course. So could you start by telling us just a little bit about a typical day of remote instruction and what that looks like for you? Sure. Um, we start off, school starts at 830, but I always open up my meeting about 10, 15 minutes early just to have kids trickle in. And um, this is what I would do in a normal, typical situation. Mm-hmm. I would open up my door at 810 in the morning and kids would come in, even though the bell doesn't ring till 830. So I felt like we got to do the same things. Um, and so we just kind of socialize before eight, around 8.30, we say, okay, we're starting getting ready, but it isn't until about 8.35 or so when we know we have almost everybody here, screens are kind of turning on, Mm -hmm. and we spend about a half an hour um, doing SEL, which is part of the program that Mm -hmm. Davis Joint Unified set up, that our first half hour is dedicated and protected time for social emotional learning, and um, that is the foundation of it all for me, even in a typical situation in person that we Mm -hmm. do a lot of community building and social emotional growth. Um, So we do that and we do a check-in and um, do little scavenger hunts, just get people moving, just really have fun and try to continue that bond and set up that bond and build that bond and that community um, that is so hard when you're staring at a a laptop. 
but it's fun. And then we go on and we have math and we have recess. We do a 20 to 30 minute recess, depending on how much challenge there has been so far. And, um, but we always have a recess break around the same time every day. So just like we would do, do in a typical in-person situation uh-huh. and we have brain breaks every half hour or so. And I make sure like go outside, get off the computer, rest <laughs> your eyes um, and everything just to really say, take care of yourselves. Don't just sit here staring at your device and um, drink some water, all of the urgings of that we need to take care of ourselves. And so, and then we do, we, I mean, I teach 830 to 12 every day straight, live synchronous um, time. And the, the, the lessons, everything's recorded, the meetings are recorded. So if somebody were to be absent, they could get the meeting from me and, and do it. But um, I found that's the best way of reaching everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, Everybody does show up for most days. And if, so, again, if somebody's absent, they can get the video of the meeting. But um, I do teach, I try, I was, I'm, for me, I felt like it was important to try to have a semblance of normalcy by just having 8.30 to 12, we are here together as a whole class. Everybody's in their seats, so to say, so to speak. And um, so it, it feels good yeah. to me and I've heard positive things from the students and the families. I haven't heard anything that this isn't working out for people. And I have asked uh, many times, like, just please let me know if if your kid is struggling. Um, so, yeah. So for you, what have been some of the highs and lows of this time? Obviously, you know, things are not normal. You, you can't greet people in person. You don't have your eyes on uh, necessarily if a kid is really struggling. I know that I've known you for a long time, a, a little bit for a long time. I know that those are things you talk about as being very important to you as a teacher. So I imagine that's been challenging. Is, has there been anything that's really rich during this time? Um. We, it's interesting. I'm like, I'm, I'm pausing to think because the challenges are huge and many yeah. as you, you know, so many. Um, but I think for me, um, there's again, like the silver linings are there. We, we, we have been able to create a community out of nothing. You know, we've been able to create a community out of, um, be you know being separated by this huge digital universe i mean we are we are still a a group of people working together we're all in this together every action that that one takes affects the other like i mean truly i do feel that with my class and and they're getting to know each other and feeling more comfortable with each other um in breakout rooms and and building that that um that bond together um, but I think the hardest thing with that is the, um, the, the black screens when you don't have students who, and I don't make anyone turn their videos on. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a requirement or it's something I, I feel very, um, concerned about that there are, there are students who don't feel comfortable turning their videos for some reason can't. I'm like, that's totally fine. Yeah. That's part of the the social emotional um, well being. So, but because we have black screens, um, I can't, I don't know how the kids are doing because yeah. there's no body language to check up on. There's no, you know, proximity. I can't walk up to a student and say, "How you doing?" You know. Yeah. If I wanted to say that, I'd have to go in a breakout room or email or um, and 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 hope that I get a response. Um, mm-hmm. So that's the that's the hardest thing because as an educator and just standing in a classroom and looking at my kids, I I know how they're doing. I can tell and and I think the the trust and the connection I have with my students is is um, deep enough that they would feel comfortable telling me. But in this situation, I have no idea how how they are unless they were to reach out on their own. And that's really hard for a sixth grader. Yeah, that's so. such a huge challenge. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, and you're right. Teachers, they one of the things you all do is you you read your students and and you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, you know, I sent my three yeah. to DG USD and had lots of conversations with teachers over the year who <laughs> were checking in about various things. 
So now yeah. we're at this juncture where the, the school board and the administration, um, they're making progress on determining the conditions for, for reopening to in-person instruction, hybrid instruction. You know, they're looking at all those variables. I'm wondering from a teacher's perspective, what will help you feel safe and assured that you can do your best and help keep your classroom community safe too as, as we reopen? And this is such a dense topic, I realize. Um, yeah, and it's something that we think <laughs> like every waking moment of our day is spent like, imagine. what, you know? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm sitting here in my classroom right now staring at the space and wondering how we could make it work. Mm -hmm. If if there were a, a number of students who, um, in a hybrid situation, who chose to come back rather than continue with distance learning, how we would make that work with the space we have for the body size we have, sixth graders are larger, you know, <laughs> if, yeah. if um, with the furniture we have, with the ventilation that we have, you know, I'm looking at the windows, I could keep all the windows open. We have one door, but there's no cross ventilation. Um, I know that they are saying they're going to provide um, filtration, you know, portable filtrations and the right. filters in the HVAC units are good. Like, I feel like all those protocols are fabulous. Um, and really, I, I am so grateful to our school board for choosing to do what they're doing and working so hard to make sure that teachers and staff are safe and students are safe and students families are safe because that's my personal opinion that that this is what is the right thing to do yeah. um but i still looking around here um i don't know how we would make it work with that many students um and being feeling safe Mm -hmm. And I know it's a feeling versus the science, you know, but, the, but for me, even if I were to be vaccinated, which I'm not, and I think that's a whole, <laughs> whole other topic, the vaccination yeah. of teachers. Um, but um, if I were to be vaccinated with two doses and all that and had my mask on and everyone was wearing masks, sixth graders, I know could handle themselves for the most part. I really worry about um, teachers of younger students mm -hmm. Um it's really, really concerning when I think about kindergartners, first graders, second graders, even third, fourth graders, um, being able to not touch each other, not, you know, keep their masks on, just toe the line, yeah. which yeah. that's not, kids are kids. <laughs> I, I spent time <laughs> with, a, with a five-year-old recently and, and right. absolutely incapable of keeping his right. mask on. It's not his fault. It's just, right. you know, developmentally, no. he's not there. I, I totally. know the Birch Lane campus well from having all my kids go through there. It, it features outdoor spaces like an arboretum, um, you know, playground, a, a, a new site for a new NPR. There's a lot going on there. Is there talk of being able to teach outside as much as possible? You mentioned ventilation as a concern and, you know, only having one door that opens. So I'm just kind of wondering what the discussion is around things like that. You know, I, ha I haven't heard even, uh, I haven't heard any news from the district or even from our site about outdoor education, but um, I would, jump on that chance. I'm staring at the Arboretum right now. I'm looking outside in my outdoor classroom, outside my door and my windows, and I would 100% take desks out there and teach outside. Again, with the PPE, you know, we have to be same thing. We don't hang out with our friends without our masks on outside, chatted apart. You know, I wouldn't do that with students either, but I would be outside with students if, if we can have the setup out there with the desks far apart and I would be far apart and the wind would be blowing and I would feel much safer about that. Yeah. But that's again, my personal thing because I want to be outside right. all the time. Right. So. As you know, and I'm going to be interviewing uh, parents on, on kind of different ends of the spectrum next week. As you know, there are uh, people who are, are really wanting the schools to, to reopen now. And there are uh, many others who are saying, uh, you know, we, we would like the teachers vaccina, uh, vaccinated and we would like some other things in in place. 
from a teacher's perspective, what else would you like us to know right now about um, your your concerns about reopening or your hopes? Um, for me, from the Amy George perspective, yes. is you know I was just standing outside in the arboretum, looking up at the great horned owl that was hooting in the tree, and the neighbor walked by whose tree it is, and we were chatting about you know the the silver linings of having no students around is that we had a nest a nest of great horned owls last spring and wonder if they're going to do that again in our arboretum here at school and that's that is a silver lining the birds on campus but not related to students of course but here we go so i'm out there and he said have you been vaccinated yet i said no not yet you know he's like well why not i said well you know we're it's a different tiered system and we're not there yet. and he was an elderly gentleman Mm -hmm. lovely man and he and I said have you been vaccinated he said yeah I'm like they are so wonderful for you he's like yeah but you should be vaccinated I'm like yeah you know and so I I think we should be vaccinated if if we are if there's a demand for for teachers to return yes we need to be vaccinated we I also think that people who work at grocery stores should be vaccinated I think that that people who are deemed essential workers should be vaccinated but I also 100% believe that elderly people should be vaccinated to help right with the you know the um healthcare system. So I it me is that if if people in our general population are still being given the the um the advice or the, you know the man to to stay away from each other to to not gather then that holds true for me as an educator in a in a room full of students. That to me feels like gathering. I don't feel comfortable doing that because it makes me feel like here we are. I've spent almost a year not being with anybody else than my immediate family. Right. And now I'm expected to just like go inside a building and be in a space with people who are not in my family and I'm not vaccinated. And yes, I'll have a mask on, but I don't know. It's yeah. really, it, it's, it, so, yeah. Really hard considerations all the way around. So yeah. I, we are um, at the end of our time here together. I, I want to appreciate, uh, uh, just express my appreciation for you sharing time because I, I know that your day doesn't end when instruction ends. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm well aware of how much time, uh, and their own resources that teachers give to teach our kids. So yeah, it does sound like like being vaccinated and being safe is is kind of a, a baseline requirement. Anyway, thank you, Amy George. You're welcome. For joining us. You're welcome. You're welcome, Autumn. Have a wonderful day. Today's interviews are part of a series examining the many facets to reopening our local schools to in-person instruction and the multiple viewpoints around this issue. This week, I'm speaking with teachers. Diana Stommel teaches 11th grade U.S. history at Davis High School. She's been in the district for about 11 years and has taught for 14. This year, she also serves as the president of the Davis Teachers Association. Thanks so much for joining me. Happy to be here. So Diana, there are strong advocates on both sides of the reopening discussion. And there's a large group of parents advocating that reopening take place right now. Uh, can you tell us what is the Davis Teachers Association, the DTA's position, and how has your organization been involved in the decision-making process around this? Well, our position is that schools need to be safe to be reopened. Um, we have asked for vaccinations for teachers in part to protect students, and also just because nobody wants to bring home COVID to their families or inadvertently infect their students. Um, we're also looking to be in the red tier to reopen as well. Um, and a lot of that has to do with practical reasons. Um, if you try to open while well, schools are, well, the community is still in the purple tier and widespread, what that leads to is um, quarantines and shutdowns of cohorts. And that's already happened kind of with our smaller cohorts um, where several have had to shut down just because of exposure. Um, when you bring in siblings to that equation across multiple school sites, um, that leads that could lead to many, many 
uh, closures and quarantines. And kind of what we're hearing from teachers it is a concern about disrupting learning. Um, you know, we've been teaching online for a while now. Um, you know, people are in their routines. It's obviously not perfect, um, but we, we don't want to close or we don't want to open just to keep closing um, and causing that kind of disruption to our students. That's okay. We've had a lot of dogs bark during the course of the show and the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. So um, I, I interviewed last week, I interviewed Superintendent Bose, and he did talk about the school board's decision making process and, and what's been set in motion so far. He also mentioned that we need to, uh, you know, return to the red tier, we need to stay there for a certain amount of time. And, um, you know, that there are various benchmarks externally that we have to meet before returning to school. So I imagine as a teacher, you're dealing with some of the parents who want to, to reopen now. And I, I think we can understand that this has been a hard situation on, on everyone. So we, we did talk about uh, the return to, to the red tier. And I know yeah. from interviewing Superintendent Bose, we talked yeah. about some of the other things that have to be in place. He, he mentioned things like filtration in the classrooms. But from a teacher's perspective, two questions what else okay. needs to happen and then second how are how are teachers feeling about returning um the district has a decision to make they said be, by may 3rd to 7th they'll be decide if it is if there's enough merit to uh to reopening for the short the month uh, the last month of school mm -hmm. so how are teachers feeling about that um, okay, so just to start with teachers, we did run internal polls to figure out kind of where people were and um, seeing in what conditions um, they'd feel comfortable coming back. We've been working with the district since the summer, since before school opening, um, trying to come up with processes, deal with things as they come up. And it's been, you know, kind of a trying time because metrics have changed, um, infection rates have changed. And, you know, we kind of agreed to take more of a cautious approach, uh, particularly before the holidays, because right. there was a lot of concern that, you know, the infection rates would go up because of Halloween, because of Thanksgiving, and all that actually came true. Um, the district, I know, has been working very hard to change out air filters, um, to upgrade, to, um, you know, put things in place that would make reopening possible, including testing of students as well and having testing sites just for um, asymptomatic testing. And all of that is, is really good, um, but just kind of our general feeling is that it needs to happen within the context of teachers being, vaccinate, being vaccinated. And, you know, we've gotten through this whole, this whole pandemic without, people getting seriously sick, students or teachers or admin getting seriously ill from school. And we're almost to the finish line. Um, we're in the tiers where teachers get vaccinated. Um, and so to me, it seems very sensible to make sure that school employees are vaccinated before they return just because of our close contact with, with children. Right. Um, so there's that. Um, as far as what teachers feel comfortable? Was that the second part? Yeah. What would it take for teachers to come back? Yes. Um, I, you know, I think it's really just what we've been setting out, you know, being vaccinated, being in the red tier. Um, and, and, you know, as far as like, well, why wouldn't you reopen school after May? Um, I know that the, uh, the school board will be discussing that. Part of that is, though, is, again, it's the idea of disruption. Once you transition back into some sort of in-person learning with hybrid, um, then that's a whole disruption to routines. Um, it's a whole different way of teaching. It's setting new expectation, new class rules. Usually this is the kind of stuff we do at the beginning of the school year. And then it, it takes a couple of weeks to really get into that kind of rhythm, right? Yeah. So the concern with putting it off for too long, like starting too late is that we wouldn't get to the point where, um, you know, we would be teaching. Yeah. yeah. I, 
I think everyone can agree this hasn't been an optimal situation for, right. for parents, students, district, teachers, for, for anyone. Um, but I, I have been most curious to ask a lot of people that question about what is the wisdom in reopening for a short period of time versus the risk. And so what I'm hearing is that there are still concerns on the part of, of teachers about that, that risk and that yeah. risk of taking at this point in time. Yeah. And I mean, everyone wants to be back in their classroom. You know, I've read that, you know, we're trying to run out the clock that Davis teachers don't want to return to school. And that's just false. Like we do want to be back in the classroom. Um, you know, it's, it's where we want to be. It's our job. Um, but on, on the other hand, we want to do so safely. Yeah. Switching gears just a little bit, Diana, we have a couple minutes left together. From your perspective as a teacher, what has your experience been like? You're working with 11th graders, so they're they're old enough to have some autonomy in how they direct themselves, but obviously they're still in school and still still need guidance. What's it been like trying to cultivate a a remote community, a remotely connected community during this year? Um, well, it's really difficult, right? I mean, it's really difficult for students. Like I, I have a high schooler at home, you know, and he really misses his friends and his social interactions. And, you know, he'd rather be back at school, which probably surprised him because he didn't really like school before, but <laughs> he really misses it. Um, it is hard just to build that community because it's so different. You know, you're online, uh, people, particularly high schoolers, aren't super comfortable talking out loud in class. So, you know, a lot of community comes via chat, which has been kind of a transition for me. And I guess for me, it's, um, I guess I'm poking more fun at myself just because, you know, <laughs> um, I'm trying to make people feel more comfortable and just being open to talking and um, hopefully getting something out of the year. And, you know, I've tried to be very um, flexible with students just because, you know, people have had varying experiences. Some people's parents have lost their jobs. Um, some people, some of my students have lost their homes. Some have lost family um, to COVID. There's been death. So it's, um, you know, it's just a, a time for, I think, you know, for me to be super compassionate and flexible and, you um, trying to help students get through this. And I think there's some kind of camaraderie in that because we're just trying to get through yeah. um, a really difficult time. Yeah. Well, your students sound lucky to have you and, and to have that perspective from you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for taking a, a few minutes out of what I'm sure is a very busy day to, uh, this is a school day and we're recording on and, and Diana's yeah. agreed to meet with me for a few minutes after school to share her perspective. And we appreciate it very much. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having me.